Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's gospel lesson contains what just might be the most familiar verse in the Bible. Martin Luther said that John 3.16 captures the entire essence of the gospel and he referred to it as the gospel in miniature. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Those are life-changing words. The Greek word that's used for love in this text is agape, and it's written in the superlative form, which means it is the most unlimited, the most unconditional, the most all-inclusive love. God has reconciled the world to himself. And John says that believing is the basis of our relationship with Jesus. But judgment for not believing is descriptive, not prescriptive. Let me explain what I mean by that. In order to understand, we need to go on to the next verse, verse 17, that reads, Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Your salvation and the salvation of the world is an accomplished fact. Jesus accomplished it once and for all on the cross. And rejecting a relationship with Jesus does not prescribe the judgment a wrath of God. No, in Christ, God has chosen not to condemn people, but to show them undeserved love. Now, if you reject a relationship with Christ and continue living in darkness, the resulting separation from God is the judgment. I mean, think about it. And other texts in Scripture support this. Whether you're talking about life in this world or life in heaven, God is everlasting light and love, joy, peace, and harmony and contentment and goodness. Separation from God in this world and in the next is the opposite of all those things. Hatred and anxiety and fighting and chaos and confusion and evil. Separation from God is hell. And there are people whose lives here on earth are a living hell already, but that's not God's doing. God has not condemned them. John says that by loving darkness rather than light, they, and or very often other people around them, have already condemned themselves. Through Christ, God offers the world eternal life which describes a quality of living, a life that begins right here and now, not just an existence we look forward to in the next life. In his book, Guilt and Grace, a Swiss psychiatrist, Paul Turner, says this about the good news of the gospel. The proclamation of Jesus Christ is about the love of God, a love which is all-inclusive and unconditional. And here we impinge one of the most important themes of modern psychology. Freud has shown us that guilt is awakened in the infant's mind by the fear of losing the love of parents. Also, the traumas of, this, of the child's mental life are connected with this doubt about being loved. The anxiety of guilt is just this anxiety of being rejected and no longer loved. The child has the impression that the parent's love is conditional, that the parents will love the child only on the condition that the child is good. The truth is, Turner continues, that in their zeal to train the child up and keep the child away from wrongdoing, some parents give the impression that this is the case. Some may even go so far as to say, I don't love you today because you're a bad boy or a bad girl. 
Of course, that's not true. They love their child even when the child misbehaves, and their care to keep the child from wrongdoing is itself a guarantee of that love. Yet even if the parents refrain from speaking a lie of this kind, their children attribute the idea to them and imagine that their parents love them on the condition that they are good." End quote. Now here's the point in all of this. Many people have the same idea about Christianity, that God only loves people who are good, or people that make good decisions, or that God loves us more when we are good. St. Paul wrote in the second lesson that we read, for we are what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The purpose of our life is to do good things, to love God by loving and serving people in God's creation. But listen again to the context of those words. Listen to what Paul said immediately prior. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For Christians, doing good things, being good, striving to be good, that's our response, the result of following Jesus. God does not love us because we are good or because we do good things or make the proper decisions all the time. God's love for us has no conditions attached whatsoever. And the Christian message is perverted by those who tell children or adults that God will love them if they are good. The truth is, you are not good and neither am I. The Bible says that none of us are good, nor can we be good in and of ourselves. We are sinners in need of a savior. God is good, and it was while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. Santa Claus may only like good little boys and girls, but God loves us all so much that he sent Jesus to live and to die and to rise again so that we don't have to live in the darkness of our guilt and anxiety. You know, there are lots of hymns in our hymn book that express uh, God's unconditional, all-inclusive love. We're going to sing one of them a little later in the service. Isaac Watts, after reflecting upon the sacrificial love of God in his hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, concludes by focusing on the believer's response to God's love. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. In other words, because God in Christ has given his all for us, we are able to give of ourselves in response. Another favorite hymn that we'll sing in this season of Lent, my song is love unknown, my Savior's love to me, love to the loveless shown that they might lovely be. Even the most unlovable people you know are made lovely through the sacrificial love of Christ on the cross. The loveless, of course, refers to each one of us. The good news is that God loves us anyway and wants and enables us to share that same grace with other people. So that's my prayer for all of us this season of Lent that you and I will take the time to meditate upon just how fantastic the news of the gospel is. For Jesus' sake, your heavenly Father loves you. And what's more, the body of Christ on earth, folks gathered here this morning, we're all called to love and forgive you too. That's why we're here. It's news that changes everything. 
Guilt and anxiety and fighting and confusion need not rule our lives. May we be so convinced of that radical truth that we respond by sharing it with someone as we gather and worship and grow in the Word and serve God by serving people. Amen.